Hello, everyone. It is uh, uh, lovely, uh, lovely to see you online, and thank you very much for our viewers uh, globally around the world. Uh, and a very warm welcome to uh, this webinar today, this IAU webinar on what next? Will universities need a new business model for the future? We have uh, four speakers today, and unfortunately, for technical reasons, at any one time you will only see three of them on screen but uh, we will shift them around so everyone will get a chance to speak. Um, as said, a very warm welcome uh, to this uh, webinar. It is part of our IAU webinar series on the future of education, of higher education, of course. And um, we have had uh, uh, the wonderful experience of going through this COVID year in the year 2020 with these webinars, and we continue to do so throughout 2021. Now, as regards this uh, session today, uh, what next? Will universities need a business model for the future? Of course, there is a tension in the title uh, already, and it is, that was intentional. You know, the word business model, what is the word business model doing within the context of higher education of the idea of a university? And uh, what we're seeing uh, around the world, very, very broadly speaking, are a juxtaposition of a business model in itself, a business type university uh, driven by organization and models, which are not uh, dissimilar to the commercial sector and within the commercial sector and governed by some of those rules. And then we have the university model, which might be publicly funded which might be a collegial model on the other side of the spectrum, just very broadly speaking. At the IAU, we, of course, have a global perspective over um, the higher education landscape. And we see that these two developments are ongoing, and especially the unification of higher education is uh, something that uh, has been... Uh, has been growing over the last 30, 40 years or so. And I'm sure that Peter Masson will give us more insights on that later. Uh, we at the IAU see this with uh, some concern, uh, we must say. And uh, of course, uh, our role is also to uh, uh, show some warning flags uh, whenever we uh, perceive that there are trends in directions that might uh, make the higher landscape, higher education landscape suffer, or uh, where the infrastructure, the ecosystem, the very idea of the university may be threatened, or maybe pushed in a uh, in a direction that might be not servant to or not conducive to uh, the very three missions that the university sets out to carry out. Uh, we see that higher education is a stakeholder in society, and we very much believe that higher education is um, part and parcel of any kind of recovery system, of any cover recovery uh, development mode, uh, especially now in these days of COVID-19. So it's very important, more than ever, to uh, strengthen the higher education landscape, to strengthen higher education institutions. And we are very, very glad today to talk with uh, our dear guests, and uh, we have Peter Masson, Professor in Higher Education Studies at the University of Oslo. Um, then we see Michael Hilscher, he's the Professor of Higher Education Management and Management of Science uh, at the German University uh, in, uh, sorry, the University of Administrative Sciences in Speyer. Uh, we have uh, Lakisha Ransom. She is visiting faculty and enterprise engagement director at the Asian Institute of Technology in Bangkok in Thailand. And we are uh, still looking for Ebenezer Ovuzo. We hope he is uh, with us today, who is indeed the vice chancellor of the University of Ghana and an esteemed IU board member. Very, very warm welcome to you all. Without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor to Peter Masson, who is so kind to uh, present uh, for 15 minutes or so. And, uh, and then we will go in rounds of uh, maybe five minutes in the, in the first uh, instance um, to give first reactions to his presentations. And then we'll continue with a wider debate on the themes in hand. Thank you very, very much for being here. The floor is yours, Peter. 
Thank you very much, Andreas. Thank you very much for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity, together with the other speakers, to reflect on the issue of university governance from the perspective of the general question that we will address. Will universities need a new business model for the future? You already raised a number of key issues and, and uh, some perspectives that we will come back to. And I want to, um, to use the opportunity to, uh, to indicate that um, the presentation is based on the research that I've done together with colleagues here at, at Oslo and also uh, together with colleagues in other parts of the world. And I'm coming in from a specific disciplinary perspective. My background is in political science, public administration. It's of course not the only perspective possible, but you have to uh, keep in the back of your mind that many of the reflections are fed by my interest in university governance and uh, the political social context in which universities operate. Having said that, the first um, perspective, the first issue that's of importance is this overall question. What kind of university for what kind of society? A question that has been addressed in many societies for some time, but of course, in the current uh, pandemic time has become even more urgent. Universities are traditional and modern at the same time. They are conservative and progressive. They are inclusive and exclusive, as well as innovative and defensive. They combine this uh, institutional uh, defense strength that they have built up through the centuries of their existence uh, against invasion of alien norms, but they're also very adaptive. They're extremely effective in adapting to environmental changes and new societal expectations. So where are we? in the way in which various societies address these questions and the answers that have uh, come up in the debate. The starting point is that there are global pressures on universities to reform. They, these pressures started some time ago and they have to do with the expectations and to some extent demands towards the universities. They are internal as well as external and there is this expectation that universities adapt the way they're organized, the way they're run, their governance structures, their practic practices, and this pressure on universities tra to transform is exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Absolutely. And in this situation, sorry, sorry to yes. interrupt you. Unfortunately, your, your presentation has gone amiss. Uh, it was on the screen and then suddenly it uh, ah. left us. Okay, I'll try to uh, get it back. <laughs> I'm sorry for the interruption. And... That's fine. Because we that's fine. I should be able to we get definitely it back. saw it in the beginning and then something must have happened. There it is. Perfect. There it is again. Just excellent. Thank you so much, Peter. So Okay, so after this question and after the, the reflection on what's the starting point, the final point that I wanted to make there was that universities face in this current um, situation where they're pressured to transform, uh, amongst other things, the challenge of finding an appropriate balance, a balance between being responsible and being responsive, as well as being economically oriented, contributing to economic competitiveness of their societies, as well as e academically oriented, uh, contributing to further um, uh, uh, further knowledge uh, production, further knowledge development, etc. So, finding a balance is one of the key elements in the transformation that universities are going through. So, where do these demands come from, and what do they imply? To start with the internal ones, there's an an incredible, massive expansion of uh, university activities in the key primary areas, education and research. The number of students enrolled in higher education has exploded. Um, there are uh, assessments of uh, student numbers, which include uh, all types of students uh, uh, approaching 300 million around the world, course profiles, the number of courses, the type of courses, and in the area of research also, as we know, massive growth of activities, types of knowledge production, traditional distinctions, basic applied, for example, no longer functional. So from within the university and the disciplines within which the academic staff, the students are located, there's pressure on the university to adapt to this massive expansion. 
The external dimension, the external expectations towards the university are related to uh, the knowledge society uh, uh, concept, with, which relates to uh, accelerated change in many areas and an expectation that universities contribute in many ways to innovation. The grand societal challenges, the wicked problems where uh, traditional responses of universities no longer suffice, climate change, inequality, including uh, as we experienced again recently, vaccine inequality, security, global health, all kinds of areas where universities are uh, expected to um, contribute with new responses to deal with these challenges, intensifying global competition in many areas, where also universities are more and more expected to, to uh, become part and take uh, a position, growing need for lifelong learning, which puts uh, pressure on traditional ways of organizing education, et cetera. And in this, a key um, expectation is that universities share knowledge, share knowledge in, um, in ways that um, uh, uh, relate to the needs of society and that are creative and uh, in line with the expectations. But one thought in this is that uh, in the pressure for transformation, often traditional important key roles of universities in society are neglected. The uh, role of university in developing humanistic culture, social cohesion, solidarity, vivid public sphere are hardly ever mentioned in the uh, reform uh, agendas. And that is one key responsibility of universities to address in uh, this uh, transformation period. So what do we know about the impact of the reforms that have been going on for a number of decades now? What we've seen in the 1990s in the, in the research done on, um, uh, on the area is that there was a strong suggestion of converging trends uh, where uh, the reforms were promoting an executive model and universities were expected to introduce uh, and further develop uh, their executive model which led to the assumption that all higher education systems would become more or less similar in their governance modes, their governance practice, both nationally as well as institutionally. And in these three levels, we identified the relations between national and institutional governance um, actors and bodies, the interactions at the central level in the, in the universities, and the relationship between central university level and the academic processes, uh, the staff, the students, education, research. And that meant in practice that the reform initiative clearly intended to have the following impact. The national institutional interactions were expected to become more executive with increasing uh, demands for accountability. So how do the universities use their uh, increased autonomy and their uh, professional leadership and management structures and a growing density of, of bodies and actors. Before it was the ministry, institutional representatives. Now we see all kinds of other actors involved, other ministries, private sector uh, actors, uh, agencies in the area of quality assessment, research funding, internationalization. So it has become a very dense area. When it comes to the central level at the universities, there we see this pressure to formalize, standardize, specialize, centralize uh, key features of the administration linked to the growing, uh, as, as indicated, the growing demand for accountability. So what are universities doing with the public and private uh, funds that are invested in them, what are universities doing and how are they using the autonomy that they have. And when it comes to the third interaction between the university central level and the academic processes, there we see that the formalization, et cetera, of the administrative support um, meets increasingly diverse academic activities, which are partly uh, in response to the uh, external um, developments that I presented just a minute ago. So in looking at what are the impacts of these reforms, what is realized of the transformation that is uh, expected if not demanded, we need a reality check. Over the last 10 years, we've seen that there's not one homogeneous set of global reform impacts, which leads to more or less the same type of, of uh, governance structures and, and practices at national and institutional level. There's a rather continuous diversity in institutional governance modes, institutional governance practices. There's path dependency. There are national institutional filters that uh, make sure that these reforms uh, are um, uh, interpreted and used uh, and instrumentalized in, in an appropriate way, which leads to a kind of pendulum movement around the world in higher education and university systems and, and, and practices. 
between relatively extreme positions, private sector uh, leadership model, an executive model, or a, a democratic public academic uh, traditional model, um, a primus inter partis model. You can say the same about administration, about autonomy, about funding. We see the pendulum between relatively extreme positions uh, indicating that we are not around the world and universities moving in one direction uh, with an ultimate uh, ideal end position. We move back and forth between understandings of how institutional leadership, administration, autonomy, funding and other aspects should look like. So and where do university uh, leaders, university practices, universities position themselves in this pendulum movement and in this uh, developing external and internal pressures and expectations? Here's a theoretical model derived from the work by Jorn Olsen, uh, Osa Gonitska um, and, and other colleagues, where we identify four different visions on university governance from the traditional Humboldtian Republic of Science model to the university as an instrument uh, for national authorities, university as a representative democracy, and university as a kind of service company in competitive market settings. So in each of these uh, three new models that um, are built on the traditional Humboldtian way of organizing a university, and Humboldtian way have become more and more marginalized, but it definitely has not disappeared. We've seen in different national contexts a different emphases and different elements of these three models back. Uh, and in some cases, uh, one of these three models has become very dominant. We've seen, uh, for example, very clear cases in some countries of emphasizing the service company vision, uh, universities as service companies. And you see these aspects of governance, the role of the governance actors, the leadership role, authority, how is it um, materialized and realized? What's the role of the state? What's the rationale for university autonomy? We've seen the differences between these models and also the way in which universities can and are positioning themselves in these different uh, kind of options that are um, presented or that are realized as a consequence of the reforms. So uh, let me just give one example when it comes to the leadership role. Uh, universities as an instrument for national authorities, they're the, the leaders uh, are um, uh, often uh, at least partly externally appointed and they are managers to um, uh, check and make sure that procedures and rules are um, being um, uh, held and uh, being respected. They're also negotiators, uh, much more than, um, uh, than uh, uh, when it comes to the representative democracy model, they're more negotiators than uh, rule managers, so politicians in a democratic setting with all kinds of interest. While in the service company model, the um, the leader of a university is much more a CEO, an, an executive officer, a unit manager, which has to make sure that uh, defend uh, economically defendable decisions are made and that the university uh, is operating in the way expected in uh, a competitive market setting. So taking these, uh, these uh, more theoretical models as a starting point, uh, we've analyzed developments in universities around the world uh, based on, on all kinds of data and can see uh, different contours in different national contexts and in different regional contexts, where in some cases, university, are more, um, uh, university models are more dominated by this notion of instrument for a national authority, in others more um, uh, a representative democracy model, while in others there's more an emphasis on um, the university as a service company. And all this now is being affected uh, by the COVID-19 crisis. So taking um, these reflections on uh, the reforms, the expectations, the intentions, as well as the, the realized outcomes, the diversity that we see around the world, what are issues that are important to address in adapting a university governance models when it comes to the post-COVID-19 world, because even though it's difficult to, to imagine, there will be a post-COVID-19 world uh, sooner or later. I want to mention four aspects, and there are more to mention, and I'm sure in the, in the discussion and the questions more will be addressed, but as examples of issues that are of importance. First, of course, what are lessons that we learned during the COVID-19 period? What are the experiences, the innovations, what worked, what did not work, for example, when it comes to the use of digital technologies. 
this intensive use, unforeseen use, was not planned. It was in many cases and in many respects spontaneous, and it has had an enormous impact on the way in which we could continue to conduct our educational and research activities and the way in which leadership, management, administration uh, practices had to be adapted. But what do we learn there, and what does it uh, mean for the way in which um, the new uh, university governance model will uh, operate after the crisis? Second is the issue of the mission, the profile. Um, it has gotten a lot of attention before the, the COVID period, but it is really important that universities around the world evaluate their mission, their profile, and adapt them to new realities. We are moving to a new normal. The old normal will not come back. And one of the elements in this that we really have to address is the ac accusation of universities contributing to divisions in society and contributing to creating new elites. There are many more elements. So how can we make sure that our missions and profiles aren't um, anchored in the past, but uh, indicate where we want to be in the future? And as part of that, we also have to contribute to new global narratives about the place of university in society and the importance of public funding of universities. We've heard a narrative the last 30, 40 years about the importance to diversify funding, to move away from block grants, and to make sure that um, uh, funding for universities is distributed in a competitive environment. But we have to rethink uh, that narrative and uh, reflect again on the importance of public funding for universities. The second area is communication. And uh, related to that, uh, the relationship of university to society. We've seen around the world that universities have hired um, uh, professionals to take care of communication. And in practice, in many cases, it had been translated uh, to uh, uh, PR and marketing um, messages uh, in our relationship to society. What we need is a much more straightforward and clear communicating about uh, communication about university profile and achievements. Universities are extremely important uh, institutions in their society. They have um, uh, multiple achievements also in the area of the relationship with society. Um, uh, for example, when it comes to dealing with the, the global um, challenges, um, but there's very little included in the current PR and marketing communication of these achievements and the university's position in society. So we definitely need to rethink the way we communicate. And another element is that the universities have to, to think about what often has been referred to as the third mission, where knowledge transfer is emphasized. We have to move away from that model of knowledge transfer and service provision to think in terms of developing equal, mutually beneficial partnership with society, with public and private partners, through sharing knowledge instead of transferring knowledge. These shared uh, equal partnerships uh, are an important part of the future of, of the university. And uh, a final element here is that it, it's important to strengthen the collective voice of universities in public debates. Um, over the last couple of years, in, in various settings that I've uh, been, been um, uh, allowed to, to contribute to these public debates, there's often the complaint by other actors in the debates that we never hear the collective voice of universities. So we've got to be much, become much stronger. That also goes for the IAU, for the international bodies, of developing a collective voice that gives a, a clear contribution to these public debates. And finally, the final two points here are the international dimension of higher education. A taken for granted, obvious, clear, important dimension in higher education, but it's come under huge pressure in the COVID uh, period. So one um, uh, element here is uh, physical mobility, physical exchange. How important is that? Uh, to what extent can it be replaced by virtual exchange and digital collaboration? Most universities around the world have gotten valuable experience in the last, in the latter virtual exchange, virtual collaboration, joint classes. Um, so uh, how can we make sure that also linking it to uh, internationalization at home, that that becomes the new normal instead of the physical exchange and mobility? Where appropriate, reduce the reliance on tuition fee income from international students. Look again at the business models where tuition fee income from international students in a number of higher education systems have become an important element. Um, we have to move away from that because it, it, uh, it uh, contributes to 
the vulnerability of uh, the unnecessary vulnerability of universities. And the, the last point here that I want to mention as an example is the uh, opportunity to create together with your partner uh, universities digital mobility corridors, especially for doctoral students, but also for master students. Uh, be creative and uh, create these corridors where uh, you, uh, students are located at one university that can participate in courses, uh, lab work and other activities in any of the partner institutions uh, whenever appropriate. And the final point relates directly again to the business model, the model that uh, Andreas introduced and that as a term uh, sounds alien to universities and, and uh, rightly so, but still, it gets a lot of attention also from the external partners of the university. So how can we develop an appropriate balance between executive dimensions and the democratic co-determination uh, requirements and, and needs in university governance and decision making? We've seen around the world important examples of universities that have been able to find an, an appropriate balance. Another appropriate balance that we need is the internal support function of, of um, the, um, the uh, administration supporting academic activities and their external reporting function. We've seen over the last 20, 30 years in many universities a growing emphasis on the latter, the professional administration developing a one-size-fits-all model. Uh, but how can we um, uh, make sure that they also function well and are uh, adaptive and flexible internally? And the final point is uh, the uh, a part of the global reality of the university uh, becoming more and more part of alliances and how can we adapt the business business model that allows for an effective involvement and maybe even move part of the formal legal uh, financial economic uh, and and uh, other realities of the universities to these alliances so that we can develop new um, into university uh, business model uh, which um, then can also be linked to the on other aspects here. I said a number of examples. I hope that as a start, I, can, I gave you some uh, food for thought and um, uh, for the discussions and for the interactions that we uh, will have. And I'm looking forward to uh, both uh, your questions and feedback as well as to the other presentations. Thank you very much for your attention. Peter, excellent. Thank you very, very much. Very helpful to uh, kick us off to start. Unfortunately, I hear a very clear echo. So, might if you could turn your mute. Yes, exactly. Perfect. Thank you so much, Peter. That was uh, very stimulating indeed. Thank you very much. And uh, you've gone through many, many different areas <laughs> in the university uh, uh, model uh, models. In fact, that's uh, of course a plural. Um, and uh, it is, of course, always very difficult to speak of a university governance structure when indeed we have 196 countries in the world, uh, at least at uh, the UN, uh, and uh, just as many higher education systems. So um, indeed, it is very interesting then to see the various principles, the meta uh, level on which you have uh, portrayed uh, various different, uh, you know, the tension, the, the scheme, the, the, the various different juxtapositions of various models and that is really really helpful indeed to kick us off and uh, thank you very much for your comments on the importance of uh, public funding and uh, the developments of the last years you went back in history a little bit and that was very very important and then communication uh, knowledge transfer, the idea of uh, the place of universities in society, then aspects of internationalization, and indeed your comments on the business model as such. Interesting, actually, also what you mentioned in terms of alliances, that that might also come into the play. Um, I would like to not speak longer, but actually pass the word to Michael Hölscher, if possible, for a first reaction. What we'll do is maybe go around uh, the panel for uh, five minutes each or so for some first reactions, some first thoughts to Peter's stimulating um, presentation, and uh, and then open up a, a wider debate with some individual questions to the uh, to the panelists. And uh, indeed, uh, we also have the joy of uh, the secretary. General of the IAU, Hilleke van Land, joining us at the very end to uh, give her uh, concluding remarks on this very session. So, Michael Helcher, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, um, um, Andreas. Thank you very much, Peter, for this very interesting uh, 
um, talk and these insights, um, it is difficult actually to uh, to react to this breadth of um, ideas that Peter presented. Um, so I think I just will pick up uh, one or two aspects that uh, were of especially uh, that was especially important uh, to me and interesting. However, I have to uh, say right at the beginning that I'm speaking now from a, from a German perspective, um, although because that's the higher education system that I know best, although I did a little bit of comparative research, but that's, um, well, um, I'm mostly, uh, mainly uh, familiar with the German um, case. And as um, Peter also made clear, and you also mentioned um, now in your uh, summary, uh, the national contexts are extremely important. So please keep that in mind. Um, and maybe we have some other reactions from all over the world, as I see uh, that we have guests from everywhere. Um, one of the points I uh, would like to um, pick up um, um, is the point of internationalization uh, that Peter mentioned, because um, this is one of the um, things that we can um, clearly see within the pandemic uh, that we have a huge impact uh, here uh, with regard on different um, levels. The one is probably um, that we see um, less international students at the moment. So this is especially a problem for those uh, countries uh, that have fee-based systems and are reliant on a huge number of um, foreign students. And this is especially those um, systems that are um, yeah, very well attractive in the world and uh, the, um, the well-established um, systems of the US, um, United Kingdom and for example, Australia, uh, where we have a huge um, income uh, through the fees of the international students. Um, so this is definitely, um, yeah, impacting on the business models of many universities around the world. Uh, less so here in Germany again, because um, we don't have a fee based system. So uh, we don't get any income from our uh, international students. And um, uh, probably, um, as we can see in, uh, in, uh, in uh, past um, uh, um, uh, uh, difficult situations, let's say, or crisis, um, the number of students normally increase because people don't find jobs, um, they don't know where to go elsewhere, um, they stay longer within the universities, so student numbers normally increase um, and many uh, university systems should be able to compensate for international students then uh, by um, increasing their home student numbers. But that uh, depends um, again on the different uh, systems of income that are um, in charge there. Um, with regard to uh, research, um, Peter mentioned digitalization and um, all our um, many um, I think for many of us, very um, positive um, experiences with the digital um, collaboration. Um, at least in my case, I, I never would have thought that we uh, will be able to, to work so good together at least. Um, and that's the, the problem. Um, at least uh, it is quite um, easy to work uh, with digital uh, things, uh, these digital tools when you know each other. Uh, so um, I think this is one of the uh, things that established university networks and research networks um, definitely will profit, but it will be a difficulty for the establishment of new um, research networks and so on, um, because if you don't know the people, then it's much more, at least from my experience, it's much more difficult to, to get in touch and to get to know each other uh, only via uh, digital tools. So uh, we might to, um, yeah, we all hope that there is uh, the post pandemic um, new normality that Peter uh, mentioned. Another um, perspective with 
regard to internationalization was that Peter mentioned um, is that also st student study experience uh, might become more digitalized. Um, but I'm not sure if that is really something that we should head for. Um, uh, well, we can increase the, the international uh, cooperation with regard to digital tools. But uh, when I think about um, student experiences, um, and I discussed this uh, with colleagues from the DRAD, the German Research um, Exchange um, Agency, um, and they said, oh, now we have these digital tools, but actually I'm not sure whether, if we think about what university is about, um, and um, Peter mentioned that there is much more than just um, teaching people to uh, to share knowledge uh, to, to be able to to work in a company or something like that but um, we have to be responsible we have to um, be democratic um, and i think this is um, often connected to a much broader experience that you want uh, when you go to another country uh, and this is probably will be difficult to share only via digital tools um so maybe i stop here i think i already talked too too long this was just to say something about internationalization um as said so there are a lot of other issues that peter raised that are worth discussing thank you thank you very much michael for uh, your first reflections uh, on the reaction to to peter uh, in, in fact yeah uh, the digital world of course is something the ethics of it the uh the pragmatism, um, uh, the opportunities, but also the risks or the uh, negative side effects are, are are part and parcel of our debates uh, and will be for a long, long time. Um, perhaps uh, just a point of nature. There's no need to go uh, to to uh, stop your video. By the way, <laughs> just mute your. <laughs> I feel quite lonely on screen at the moment. I must say, <laughs> so please do come back. <laughs> Thank you. It's just the mute of the uh, muting of the microphone that is important. Um, as a next reaction, I'd love to uh, see if possible could come on board uh, our dear colleague Lakisha in uh, Bangkok, uh, if you're there, uh, is, if that's possible. Uh, or indeed, I'll have to now just speak to my colleague, Giorgio, if Ebenezer has uh, reappeared. He was there for in the beginning. So I'm just hoping for a reaction from him. So I'll leave it to Giorgio to try and uh, up our next Excellent. So unfortunately, even these are, uh, it was there, but uh, somehow for some technical reason, it uh, did not make it. So uh, Lakisha, it would be wonderful if you could come on board. Uh... Okay, so, okay, so there, she is. there she is. Lakisha, Lakisha great, great to see you. Great to see you. Okay. So just let me introduce Lakisha Ransom. This is the Enterprise, Enterprise Investment Director, Director Asian Institute of Technology. Of technology. And, uh, and uh, you will certainly certain see that she has uh, her, her roots in the USA. USA. Thank, thank you so much, Lakisha. Thank, 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 thank you so much, Andreas. Thank you, Peter, for sharing the findings and the recommendations of your rich body of research, and to Mikael um, for sharing your reactions. I would just like to pick up on a few of the points um, um, that have been mentioned. Um, when, when we think about, you know, the role of governance as it relates to universities as, you know, crucial places for knowledge and solutions to global or problems, um, you know, innovation comes out of constraints and we're certainly facing a number of constraints. Um, at this moment. Um, crises have a way of accelerating and forcing change, and they force us to take action in areas that uh, we may have ignored or at least may not have prioritized. Uh, many of the trends that, that Peter mentioned have been in the works for years, but the COVID-19 pandemic has pushed them to the forefront. And, um, and, and so, what, you know, when, when you ask you know, how might we imagine the world post 
pandemic, you know, I, I imagine that it's going to be much more difficult for economies. So thinking about this from the macro um, um, societal perspective, it's going to be much more difficult for economies to expand and, and therefore uh, much more difficult for, um, for job creation to occur within societies. And, and so there will be um, an increased reliance on innovation. And I believe that this is something that the universities can, can contrib contribute to in the sense of the research that happens within them, but then also the students that we pr produce with, within our institutions. So, you know, the purpose of education is to teach students how to learn and, you know, so that um, they know how to apply these um, insights to real problems. And, and so I, I think increasingly we will um, need to shift um, our identities as, as being one of problem solvers. And I, I believe that it's uh, at the core of why we exist. Um, you know, if we go to the deepest levels of why, why universities, why were we ever created as institutions? And I believe that um, um, even when we look at teaching and research as two of the consistent uh, missions across various university structures, but it's, it's to solve problems. And so how do we encourage students um, within our institutions to, to become problem solvers in society? And it extends beyond helping them to uh, choose a major. It's about how we um, integrate the disciplines within, within the institution. And sometimes, you know, as, as Peter mentioned, there are both external and internal pressures. And, and depending on the uh, compensation of the, the rewards, the, the, the hierarchies that exist within the, the institutional structures, it may not be as, as simple to achieve as it is to say, but I believe that this is part of the answer in terms of how we get students to think more holistically about complex global problems that the university has a unique position to be able to address. Um, you know, we are, we've certainly seen over the past, you know, 10 months or so, you know, um, the implications, the consequences of, of leadership and governance. We've seen examples of strong leadership where people have made difficult decisions during times of amplified ambiguity. And we've also seen what happens when leaders have failed to act and respond to crises. So, so I believe that, you know, the timing of, of this discussion is, is certainly an opportunity for us to reflect on this uh, collective force experiment that we found ourselves in in 2020 in terms of what have we learned and how can we how can we reposition ourselves in the, as institutions going forward both in terms of how we are structured and the impact that we have in society it's um you know again when we look at the macro level this is an opportunity to develop human capital um, i believe that you know we'll see increasing levels of digitization and the leveraging of technology within society. Um, it's an opportunity for more people across sectors to work remotely. So how do we, how do we prepare students um, to, to enter um, this, this new reality of the world that we are in? Um, and it really can only happen if those of us within the higher educational sector, um, you know, really um, look as, as, as broadly as we possibly can in terms of how to improve happen, human capital across various geographies and dem, um, demographics. So it, it, it goes back to Peter's point in terms of being um, inclusive um, and, and being intentional about how we are inclusive um, as it relates to um, various populations. Um, you know, this is an opportunity for entrepreneurship. It, it links um, to an earlier point that I, I made as it relates to innovation. Um, it seems as though the world is moving into a recession, so there will likely be fewer traditional jobs available. Um, and so how do we create an entrepreneurial mindset within our institutions? Um, universities tend to be highly process oriented. Um, and, and, and so to really speak to the broader theme of the session in terms of do universities need uh, new models, I would say unequivocally yes. 
And, and if we do not reposition ourselves as institutions, you know, we're starting to see new entrants um, um, from, from entities that are not necessarily universities that are making inroads into our space. So, so there is one, um, one company that I can think of that, um, you know, it positions itself as the Netflix of education. And it raised $100 million two months into the pandemic, and it provides online, you know, engaging um, courses for people. And, and so I, I think that there's still, you know, a thirst uh, for, for, for knowledge, for, um, for, for learning, um, and it's just a matter of how we as universities are able to respond to, to this demand. How do we, how do we um, prepare students to, to not only learn, but apply um, what they're learning? And so when we think about entrepreneurship as it relates to emerging economies, so, so um, as Andreas mentioned, and as you may pick up from my accent, I am from the United States. I, I currently live and work in Bangkok. Um, and it's been said that this is the Asian century. I, you know, I, I, I'm just, I'm quoting what has been said. So I, I don't want to, you know, to, to state that as fact per se, but there are certainly indicators that there is um, exponential growth happening in this continent. And so when we think about um, in China, as an example, 60% of the Chinese GDP comes from 30 million SMEs or small and medium sized enterprises. So what role does university, what roles, what role do universities have? in um, contributing to that type of economy, to, um, to that type of, of system whereby um, we have many small and medium-sized companies that are driving the economic growth of countries and of regions. And I think that it's important that, that we, we keep that in mind. It's important that we educate uh, students to um, you know, really focus on real problems. And, and it's not only about the students, it's about the types of research that we conduct. So, so in, there are lots of problems, lots of crises, as I said on the outset, from education, healthcare, climate change, infrastructure. How do we reposition uh, education to be relevant and to transform the lives of everyday people? And you know, I guess I will just um, pause here with with um, you know. I, I think this is an opportunity for us to be um, to to look at ourselves authentically and to to ask whether we are um, leveraging and relying upon 19th and 20th century pedagogy to prepare students for the fourth industrial revolution. And, and, and it goes beyond just the integration of technology, you know, adding some cameras into our classrooms. But you know, what are the fundamental assumptions that we are making about learning, about how institutions remain relevant to society? And, and how can we ensure that we are preparing um, um, students who will then go out into society for the types of transformation that are occurring. What we do know about this fourth industrial revolution is that the life cycle of, of jobs will continue to shrink um, with, you know, as, as, as technology, artificial intelligence and machine learning intensifies. And I believe that it's an opportunity for, for universities to engage in a, in a slightly different way, perhaps in a drastically different way. You know, as, as we are currently structured, Students pay for tuition up front, you know, so whether it's a four year degree, three year degree, four year degree, five year degree, and then the service more or less ends upon graduation. Um, what we see with uh, Generation Z, the millennials and, 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 and future generations is that um, continuous learning, educational benefits with their employers are, are highly um, sought after benefits. Um, because both employers and employees recognize um, the need to be able to reinvent, retrain, and retool, um, you know, periodically to ensure that um, they remain competitive. So I believe that universities have a, a central role in playing um, to ensure that that happens across society. Thank you. Thank you, Lakisha. Yeah, yeah. 
where it did. Where it did. You, 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 Excellent. Yeah, thank you, Lakisha, very much for your first reflections and also uh, pushing the bait uh, also towards a perspective of the student and the employability and the future developments and the economic and uh, and, and especially uh, within, within, the, within the debate of innovation. Uh, innovation comes out of constraints and indeed we are seeing those constraints more than possibly ever before in uh, these uh, these times of COVID-19 indeed and then exactly that's also a part of what we wish to discuss today are really what is the university and how does it need to future-proof itself how need, and how does it need to set itself up in order to be able to face the challenges of today, but especially also of the future. And thank you very much for your input on that. Uh, you raised various, various pertinent um, points in, with regard to the fourth industrial revolution uh, students and how universities will need to um, possibly also tune in more to the developments within the business sector and the commercial sector. Um, Lakisha, I will have a chance to follow up on that in a second round of questions uh, there. What I would like now is just to go quickly back to uh, Peter and, uh, and also zoom in on leadership. And uh, let's just all pretend we are university vice chancellors, rectors or presidents. And uh, from that perspective, um, there is a question that has arisen in my mind, and that is during your presentation um, that we're speaking about ideal types of higher education a model, so to speak. And, uh, and there is this tension, of course, that there are so many different national systems. And I wonder at a global level, and this is also, you've mentioned that, uh, uh, that, that we need to speak with one voice. Uh, but what is the one voice of higher education today if you have such a multilateral system of higher education systems on a national level, on a regional level? Um, there are, we see, uh, and this has been going on for the last 10, 15 years or so. There is a kind of a new architecture, a new infrastructure, maybe even a debate, a platform on a global level. We see it at UNESCO. We see it uh, within even the regional side, the EU. We see it uh, possibly also in the OECD. Um, and that is a uh, an attempt really to have a debate on the global scale as to governance, as to the right business model, if you want to say, use this contentious word. Um, and in terms of, of course, what does a strong higher education landscape look like and what does it need? And the IAU, of course, is very much uh, embedded within exactly that discourse. Um, my question is, are we kidding ourselves to just pu push that point? Is a higher education system indeed steeped only within its national local tradition within its uh, national legal framework? And uh, are we kidding ourselves that an international debate on higher education systems will actually intrude and impinge on a national debate of uh, higher education? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andreas, uh, for this important point. Um, let me briefly reflect on that. I do think, of course, as we, um, uh, as also Lakisha and Michael have, have emphasized, it, uh, as you have emphasized, have emphasized, the national context is important. It's a context where the universities have um, uh, been uh, developed within a legal, uh, regulatory, as well as a financial economic reality. Uh, it does make a difference, like in my country, where there's absolutely no tuition fee for any student or you go to a system like Australia or other systems where there are high tuition fees as just one, one example. So of course the national context is important. But the global connection that we have is around knowledge and around the kind of challenges that both uh, Michael and uh, Lakisha also were into. That um, the way in which we uh, use knowledge, develop knowledge, apply knowledge, interpret knowledge to deal with not just local and national issues, but global issues, is something that connects us. And we've seen uh, global university alliances emerge. We've seen networks. We've seen uh, partnerships between universities uh, around the world. I am leading a uh, project together with the University of Iowa, where all the students in Iowa and in um, Oslo in our uh, program areas 
are following uh, joint courses, have joint exercises, exams, uh, have a joint archive, etc. Um, not on the basis of uh, making sure that uh, the students have the same experiences, but opening up for uh, experiences and relevant knowledge uh, perspectives from other parts of the world. So I do think that uh, if we talk about the voice of the university, uh, that we have to um, uh, link it both to the national context as well as the global context. And in the national context, there are specific policy challenges and issues. Michael indicated in Germany, there is a very specific agenda and the German universities are part of contribute to discuss that agenda, which might not be relevant or even recognizable in other contexts. But at the same time, some of the issues addressed in Germany or in Norway or in Thailand or in any other country around the world are relevant anywhere. And that is what I tried to address in the last points that I mentioned. How are we going to reposition ourselves, as Lakisha would say, when it comes to international uh, the international dimension in higher education. Um, we cannot go back to a model where we stimulate as many students as possible to travel to another country to get some kind of experience, while the majority of the students will never have that chance. So how can we make sure that as a starting point, all our students become part of and uh, experience and profit from the international dimension of higher education? And that is something that we've definitely learned in the pandemic. It's possible to organize. It has its challenges and there will be physical mobility, but we got to move away from uh, emphasizing physical mobility to looking at new ways of stimulating internationalization. Now, come back to your point of the, the voice of universities. I do think that the universities have underestimated the power that they can have if they develop collectively a kind of contribution to uh, some of the debates that are going on uh, around inequality, around climate change, uh, and around the, the, the potential of the university as the main knowledge institution in any society to contribute to that. Not to dominate it, but to contribute to that. Not in the form of transfer knowledge, but sharing knowledge. And we've seen many good examples around the world. Uh, and I do think, again, when it comes to communication, we can do a much better job than we're doing now um, in communicating what our, what's our position in society, what do we contribute, what are our achievements, and how uh, do we see uh, the further development of the university uh, and its uh, society, as, as well as societies in which it is uh, located. Thank yeah, you. I absolutely uh, would agree with what Lakisha and Peter have said. Um, it is actually um, a multi-level problem uh, that um, every researcher, but especially um, higher education governance, has to face. Uh, for example, if we think about um, uh, the values or the, the reasons why we should uh, fight uh, inequality, exclusion and so on, um, are the same all over the world. But how to do that is absolutely different in each of the countries and in each of the local contexts. And that is probably the thing uh, where I would say where the universities um, and higher education institutions transfer these global ideas, this global knowledge that Peter mentioned um, into um, the local um, uh, yeah, um, uh, responsiveness. Yeah? And that is, um, I think, uh, with regard to um, needs of the companies um, and employability, but also with regards to civil society actors and so on. So as universities, we are, I think, we have to manage this linkage between uh, the global uh, ideas, the global knowledge and the local needs that um, are uh, yeah, given to us uh, from the companies um, in our local um, community, but also from uh, the civil society and other actors. And um, what is really difficult then is um, with regard to um, international competitors, as uh, Lakisha mentioned, um, large companies that are uh, presenting uh, nice and um, approachable, um, easy accessible uh, teaching um, in a global scale. Um, and we have scale effects there, definitely. Yeah. If they just get, uh, if they have a thousand students and um, get 10 euros from each of them, 
um, they already have quite a lot of money. Yeah, so um, um, we have to think about how we can uh, can um, yeah uh, be compete with these kinds of of teaching. But um, with regard to um, the the question of uh, are universities problem solvers? Um, definitely, they should. Um, but with regard to this um, uh, this yeah, I don't know what the the English word for spagat is. Um, actually, <laughs> does anybody know? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you you have these two uh, this tension. Let's say this tension between the global and the local. Um, so um, I think it's also um, another tension between uh, problem solving and being uh, reflex, keeping some reflexive distance. Yeah, and uh, I'm not uh, in Germany. There is a um, an ongoing debate on the third mission and whether we should make the third mission the first mission. Um, and to if transformative science and the transformative university should be the the aim to go for. And I, in my perspective, I think we need we need a balance. Um, Peter always mentioned balances. Um, and I think that's uh, that's what we need. Um, we need a transformative science um, and new forms how we can transfer our teaching, our research into the community. Uh, but we also uh, have to be um, careful uh, not to lose our reflexive distance. Yeah? And I'm not sure how to do that. Um, if that is possible to do it by um, differentiating within the institutions, within our organizations or within the system? Should we have some universities that are more problem solvers and some that are the um, reflexive instance, uh, instances of their society? Or shall we have people within each institution that do the one or the other? And. Um, that's one of the questions for me, for the German, especially for the German system at the moment. Um, uh, how shall we differentiate with regards to these different uh, tasks that we have? Or how to integrate them, actually, <laughs> if that's possible. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Just as a quick follow up question uh, there, because um, there are many, many different themes that we are approaching here. And uh, one is, of course, uh, universally leadership models, governance models. One is the various different missions of universities that we have identified them. And then uh, what Lake Shaw's brought in was the private sector very strongly and uh, the developments there and the interaction of the private sector and uh, what uh, competences and skills and uh, pedagogy universities uh, could or should or must um, choose in order to address the needs of, you know, future societies. Um, what we do see in all of this, and what is it that the core of universities take, you know, keep together, and that really are academic values in a sense. And uh, I think we can all agree that academic values are the the, the various the, the the elements, the core elements uh, that to define the idea of a university in uh, as. As, as difficult or as 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 uh, as uh, multiple uh, universities are systems are, it's the uh, values that we have. And uh, and Michael, I uh, you, you've touched upon it in the sense that there are various different political organizations or political entities. Um, let's say governments. There are regional interests. They are very strong national interests when it comes to government uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and various challenges that we see all over. You mentioned this health, climate change, uh, inclusion, uh, equality, all these various things that we absolutely need and must tackle in order to overcome the challenges. But the interesting thing, what you've alluded to, and I, I'm, I'm also now uh, um, pointing to a recent piece that you wrote in a publication for the 70 year celebrations of the IAU, which was really showing the tensions between uh, academic values 
and national interests when it comes to the higher education. Could you maybe just expand a little bit on that? Because I think it is really important also as a constraining factor for uh, university governance models. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, what I was talking um, or trying to explain in that piece of paper and that which is uh, relevant maybe for this uh, talk as well is um, um, with regard to comp if we increase competition on different levels, um, for example, between national economies um, and when national economies become more and more knowledge based, as Peter uh, pointed out in his um, in his first presentation. Um, then uh, um, political leaders want universities co to contribute to their national good. Yeah? And um, Peter say, um, described one specific type of uh, higher education system where they are um, part of the, of the system and of the line and only uh, have to respond or follow actually uh, political um, rules. Um, um, but I think that is a, a pressure that we see in all university systems, that national economies say, well, uh, try to find the, let us be the first to find the vaccine, and then uh, our companies here in our country, that will make a lot of money. Yeah? And we keep the money within our national uh, economy. Um, but the universities would say, well, let's join forces not from an from from a universal uh, value perspective scientific perspective we would say let's work together let's see we exchange all our uh, all our knowledge on this vaccine and so on yeah um, we have another level uh, uh, another level though um, hindering this uh, and that is the competition between universities and organizations now, because national uh, university systems put pressure on the universities, on the organizations to compete with each other, also in economic terms. And if Oxford, when Oxford now found um, uh, one of these vaccines, um, well, they will get uh, uh, funds from the patent. Yeah? And that's important for uh, Oxford. Um, um, yeah, to get this money uh, to be uh, competitive within the coming years. And, um, but again, I would say um, from, a, from a universal um, point of scientific exchange and knowledge, um, they should be happy to be the first one to have found that, uh, this kind of vaccine. But after that, you should exchange <laughs> all the information to, to help uh, the scientific progress. Yeah. And this is um, uh, as a as a as a uh, university governance or a, as a university leader, though, you have to always to balance this um, uh, this uh, scientific exchange thing versus being competitive as an organization. You have to care for your organization. You have to make your university um, uh, as we said in the in the beginning, you have to uh, find different funding um, streams, different um, in kinds of income, and so on. And competition helps you to um, uh, to increase your income here. Yeah? So this is uh, again this tension uh, that, um, with regard to leadership, I think um, every university leader um, finds himself or herself. That's, I mean, it's, it's really quite interesting. I hadn't thought of it uh, that way before, Mikhail. And as I listen to you, I, I wonder what that balance is between collaboration and competition. Um, I, you know, I, I think that um, in, in many cases, it's competition that pushes us um, to, to move beyond boundaries, to stretch, to, to reach new levels of knowledge creation. And so, I, and I, I do believe that there, um, there is some benefit that comes from a competitive model. But to, you, to your point, you know, using the example of the vaccine creation, at what point does it become, um, you know, a, a public good 
particularly in, in the midst of a, of a pandemic. So, so how, how do scientists within institutions share, um, you know, their findings and, and still, you know, they're able to, to, to drive forth and, 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 and get the residuals um, from the patent creation and, and all of, all of the um, benefits that come with that. You know, I, I'd just like to briefly touch on one of the earlier points around, you know, the governance structure and, and maybe the societal impact. How do um, institutions collaborate across uh, regions or, or, or um, uh, globally, if you will? And, you know, I'll, I'll be brief, but I, I think in terms of governance structures, and I, I think back to my time in the U.S., there are institutions in the same region, within the same country, sometimes in the same city, that have different governance models um, because of, of their missions. And, and so I, I do think that it would be quite challenging to, to come up with some sort of universal governance model. Um, you know, I, I, I would agree with what um, colleagues have said in terms of, um, you know, looking at these macro issues, and I know it at AIT, we're quite focused on um, the SDGs as indicators and how we incorporate them into our research and education and even our operations. So, you know, we're focused on climate change and food, water and energy security and, and things of the like. So, so I, I do think there's an opportunity to take, you know, these macro challenges that we face across societies and find ways to, to localize them. So I, I just wanted to touch on that point before we moved on. Peter, yes, absolutely. Sorry, sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll pass the, war, uh, the word to you. And indeed, um, I'm, I'm just thinking uh, of uh, the various different tension points, of course, between uh, governments, between academic production and about business interests. And indeed, th those are tensions that uh, Michael has really clearly uh, made, made reference to. And it is, I think, something that indeed the future university governance model will have to address exactly these kinds of points of tension between uh between uh, stakeholder uh responsibility to funders uh, their own academic interests and thus also their values and indeed to political interests and then again also the meta uh, the meta level uh, international cooperation so any thoughts on that peter mm, thank you thank you yes i i fully agree and and they they were both uh, lakisha and um, and uh, michael were uh, coming with important reflections. I think as, as a part of the response to that, I want to come back to, to something I mentioned before. Universities have to contribute to the development of a new narrative. The kind of, let's say, distinctions that we also address here between the public and the private sector uh, are outdated uh, in many respects. And, and the, the narrative that we've heard in the university sector for 30, 40 years, that we have to become more like businesses, uh, that we have to diversify our sources of income, that we have to have more private sources of income, uh, was all based on uh, an assumption uh, which was fed in the 1980s, 90s by quite a lot of publications and, and uh, debates that the private sector has a model that's of relevance for the university. I would seriously challenge that. Um, I would say that um, the, uh, the reliance on a private sector model doesn't help us in the time of a pandemic. It's the public domain, the government, that has to help us out of this uh, crisis. I mean, the, the Pfizer um, uh, collaboration with BioNTech. BioNTech got more than 500 million euros from, uh, from uh, the EU uh, in the contribution to developing uh, the vaccine. Uh, without the, the, the public, uh, whether it's in, in Europe or in, in the US or in Asia or in, in Africa, Without uh, the public domain, the government creating support structures, financial and others, for those who suffer in the pandemic, uh, we wouldn't be able to come out of it. It's not the private sector that helps us out of here. Uh, and therefore, I think in the new narrative, we have to look for both partnerships with the private sector. So, the, the example that Lakisha gave uh, about uh, the company that raised $100 million uh, is, is interesting, and it opens up for partnerships. I don't see um, 
the, the, the first um, uh, way forward here was look at competition and collaboration. I think the only way forward is collaboration. I don't see a, a competition here around a specific kind of models, but both can profit from collaboration. Universities aren't able and aren't willing to adapt their business model and their practices to uh, new kinds of demands on the labor market, but the traditional demand for higher education still exists. I mean, if I look at my students or reports of, uh, around, of students around the world, they're dying to get back to the campus. I mean, uh, they're fed up with being locked up in their student dorm or wherever they are following online education. They want to meet their fellow students again. They want to meet the teachers again. They want to be able to uh, profit from uh, the spaces that the universities are offering uh, in real life. Um, so part of, of the new narrative um, relates to the points that I made at the end of my presentation. What did we learn in, in the crisis? What kind of partnerships are possible? What are way forwards also when it comes to the university profile and mission? How can we find a good combination or balance, if I, you allow me to use that word again, between uh, the public and the private domain, um, the role of the university as a contributor and stimulator of the economy, but also as an academic institution. Uh, Clark Kerr used already in the 1960s the term multiversity. Uh, so how can we um, move forward here, profit from uh, experiences, lessons, um, develop uh, partnerships with the private sector wherever it's feasible and possible, but not in an unequal situation, but as equal partners, uh, and how can we make sure that our academic values and principles are not uh, watering away, uh, but uh, provide a strong foundation for these partnerships? So these are, I mean, these are not easy issues, and uh, there's not, let's say, one solution that we can all adhere to ne uh, next week or so. But these are uh, also the issues that you wanted to address, I assume, in this uh, webinar. I mean, what are the challenges that the universities are facing? They're not easy. And it's not just the university that faces challenges. But I do think that there are uh, good trajectories, as also Michael and Lakisha have pointed to, forward in this, that we also can learn from each other, because there are many very valuable and positive experiences of universities around the world in different contexts and in different issues related to not just the pandemic, but this uh, request for or demand for transformation. So, um, and this also then relates to uh, what the university wants to contribute to the narrative. Where does it see its position in society? Uh, and what kind of society does it want to contribute to? Uh, again, uh, no uh, easy questions, but uh, questions that are important for everyone in the university to take seriously and, and if possible to contribute to, also to make sure that we have an open debate here instead of a uh, relative elitist um, uh, debate where only a few are participating, because I don't think that anyone in the university would, would, uh, would like to see that. Peter, thank you very, very much for, uh, uh, you know, the, in fact, for summarizing so many of the themes that we have discussed today. And uh, I completely agree uh, that um, the challenges that we are seeking really come down to various, various different inherent uh, university um, model solutions in the sense that you mentioned uh, BioNTech. You mentioned that we are now in a serious, serious crisis. Uh, there are hundreds and thousands and even millions of people who are dying. Uh, we are all in a humanitarian crisis, let's face it, uh, with economic, with social, with psychological uh, um, um, consequences uh, to the extent that we have not seen. Recently, I had the pleasure of uh, looking into a uh, press conference. I was with Angela Merkel, and it was a discussion with, indeed, the founders and the uh, heads of uh, BioNTech. And the overall um, discourse was the pride that for 30 years, the public money had gone into basic research, which indeed had then along the line uh, created and uh, you know made available and uh, made possible uh, the emergence of this vaccine that will now so show us. And it showed international collaboration, it showed inclusivity, it showed uh, that uh, the migratory history of uh, the, the bosses of uh, that, uh, that very uh, company, but also it showed the multiplicity of nations working, of sciences working on this project within. So it really had all these various different dimensions of inclusion, 
of uh, long-standing public investment in basic research and, uh, and, and indeed how important the uh, publicly funded uh, landscape was in order to overcome. And I think it's a very good example, just an example of many, and you mentioned just a few as well, for uh, some of the problems that we see that you mentioned it yourself, that there are the private, more commercially driven sectors in the higher education landscape that are now suffering that are now more seeing, we're seeing they're more vulnerable than ever than they were before. Um, and maybe this is just a, a quick uh, observation from our side. Now I have the great pleasure of passing the word to Hilleke van Land, the uh, IU Secretary General. And uh, unfortunately one of us will have to say goodbye uh, from the screen, but I do hope that you are going to continue listening in. And uh, yes, let me pass the word to Hilleke van Land, who I'm sure uh, knowing her well, uh, will have uh, uh, some concluding remarks on her own uh, to contribute to what the future challenges of the higher education sector are and how we can overcome uh, some of the challenges that uh, society will face. Hilleke, if you could come in, please. She should be with us in just two seconds, and I apologize. We have, uh, uh, we were we were remarking on how fantastic remote working and digitalization, and all the potential, etc. But we also see that <laughs> if we were all standing in a room, <laughs> we'd be speaking, speaking directly, directly with each other. <laughs> yeah, there it should be. There she there is, she indeed. Is the world that the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, I would like to start by thanking. Uh, and uh, speakers for this uh, very great uh, discussion at the um, uh, to kickstart actually the second leg of the IU webinar series on the future of higher education and I think we touch on something that is really at the heart of the reactor <laughs> and thank you Peter for having uh, explored and, and explained the various uh, models that you have been able to uh, to map uh, around the world. Thank you for Lakisha for your comments on this and Michael Holscher as well for uh, taking on the debate on these various uh, issues. What I found fascinating is that it uh, looked like impossible to get out of this uh, a business discourse, <laughs> whereas you tried to get us out of it, Peter, and uh, I think that is exactly where the IU indeed wants to go in the future, uh, to try and, and convince the many that the business model is certainly not the one that we should, should keep. It was, as you said rightfully not just a few minutes ago, a discourse that was launched in the 80s and 90s and today should be discarded and we see it uh, during the COVID period. We have to rethink the higher education sector in a different way and, and shed new light on it. I think we have a unique opportunity towards the end of this very year, and that is the World Higher Education Conference 2021 uh, that UNESCO is developing now. And as an IU, we are invited to be one of the key partners to the development of, uh, of a discourse uh, for the future of higher education. And I would certainly invite you to work with us on the kind of statement that we would be able to, um, to share with a global higher education community, also to invite the global higher education community to, to help um, wordsmith it, um, uh, finalize it, and submit it to the attention of the World Higher Education Conference. Because there will be many policymakers there. There will be many people who will decide even on the future of higher education uh, and not always with the higher education. And we have to be very vocal. I very much, and I noticed you said it a few times, but we need for universities to share a collective voice and to ensure we have a clear contribution to make as to where we as institutions and as systems want to be uh, for the future and in the future, but actually already right now. Because your key question at the very beginning was the right one. What kind of an education do we want to provide for what kind of society? And so the question is, what kind of society do we want? And thus, 
let's then on that basis, on the definition that we could find, develop the kind of higher education that we wish. And that is where I would like to respond maybe to Lakisha when you said, well, and can all these different models compete? They don't compete. There, there is space for many different kinds of models. Also a question that uh, Michael Hirscher was, uh, was alluding to, should some universities more specialize in this other than in that? I think so. Universities have the right to be different and should be different, not only uh, according to um, a national context or a political context or a, or a regional context, but as well um, to respond to various demands from society uh, within one and the same society. Not everyone entering higher education has the same aims, and yet we need for spaces uh, to be reserved for the rights for higher education to indeed preserve the values and the academic uh, values and principles that should indeed, as you said, Peter, not watered away. They should be held up very high so that we have a future for our societies that goes way beyond any kind of employability, any kind of business model, any kind of business driven model of the societies of which we have seen the limits now during the pandemic, even more so than ever before. So we've tried, we've tested it. Well, 80s, 90s, we're 2021. So that's why. Third, what? 30, 40 years, enough of that. We need to go back and tell governments that higher education matters, that it is the, one of the key drivers for transformation of society for the better. We need to indeed offer uh, potential um, re-entering opportunities for the many to benefit from high quality higher education um, in, in its broad diversity, bring back people to the campuses for them to sit, chat, have a coffee, exchange, and on the detour of a conversation, um, all, all of a sudden realize that this is where they should go, this is what they can do, this is what they can contribute, this is where they went wrong. And this cannot happen in a space, a space like this one. Here we can launch ideas, we can share them, we can bring them to the table, and it's wonderful but we need the other spaces as well. So any Google who wishes to become a higher education institution, well, good luck, but you will never succeed because you don't have the tools, the means, the contours, the, you don't have the, the, the flexibility. So what you can offer is uh, to provide for a kind of education. You can provide MOOCs, whatever. But then in the, in the, um, in the woods of that knowledge that it is then sharing, uh, it's not the high quality um, education that we actually need to create better conditions in society to address the inequality, to address the climate change issues, to address um, the food scarcity, to address even the, the, the work, uh, the world of work difficulties, no, and any of those. So indeed, I think that uh, we, we have these many different models, they can coexist. They should not compete, they should uh, cross-feed each other and certainly aim higher. That's the aim of higher education at large. So we hope that uh, the, the, by kickstarting this conversation today, we can actually uh, together uh, take the road to uh, the World Higher Education Conference 2021 and develop the, this, this common and this collective voice that you are calling for rightfully, Peter, and to have a text that is complex enough, but also clear enough for everybody to pick it up. We have to ensure that the many organizations, associations in all their diversity join in and subscribe to it and that so that we have a voice that is heard by the many but that also the, the value of higher education is not diminished. We're, we're actually, as higher education people, the best detractors of our own beautiful um, system because we always see the difficulties, we always see what doesn't work, we always see what is wrong. We're very bad at saying what we're good at. We're very bad at saying the, what the many contributions we make to society today and for the future. And so let's have a different discourse. Let's make sure that that is heard very loud and clear, and that when comes October 2021 and the Barcelona event, whether presential, face-to-face, -face, or um, hybrid, or online, no matter, 
that is the deadline we should set ourselves and we should make sure that the different webinars that will uh, pave the way to that conference will tackle different issues that are of key importance to higher education today, that we can question where we can go and that we can have this real clear voice to get uh, to the highest levels and make sure that there is a future for higher education. So we have a few in mind for you, but we would like to co-construct co them as well. Anyone who's taking part in this webinar today or any of the speakers and you, Peter or Lakish or Michael, um, please tell us if we're wrong, but we will have a session next week to uh, present the second leg of the global survey on the impact of COVID-19 on higher education. We've worked hard with many organizations from around the world, the Arab Association, the um, uh, Latin American Association, the Americans, the EUA, name it, um, from many different parts to define questions that matter. We hope that people will pick it up, that we will have many responses, that that will allow to understand where we're at, what uh, the, the future can look like, and hopefully help respond to some of the questions that we have. Also on, on this rethinking um, in, 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 a, in a construction that is really creative but positive. Then we will have one on internationalization. You spoke to that one. And indeed, we need to have many more opportunities for the many people to benefit from the internationalization dimensions. And we can do that better. We've seen it. There are many more opportunities. Yet, we will need to keep the opportunity for many to also move between cultures to understand and to get out of their comfort zones and understand that it's not by, being, by sitting behind your screen that you get that international experience to the full. But you have to experience and taste the the knowledge mechanisms in another country, see how it is being uh, used, abused and shared in universities and how you can actually confront your own, own knowledge uh, perceptions to other knowledge perceptions. And it's only then that we will be able together to mobilize our knowledge skills, even our intelligence to address the global goals that we have to face with their local um, applications as well. So internationalization will be on the agenda a few times along the way to give um, a space for many voices to come to the table. Then we will look at the place of higher education and research for sustainable development. Um, and this is in line and a prolongation of the work that the IEU does um, in the context of an IEU global cluster on the SDGs, where we have university clusters working together on SDGs, never siloing themselves off, off from the other SDGs, but really co-constructing what we do. So no competition, you're right, Peter, but we have to co-construct. We have to have this dynamic of developing things together, get together into the future, allow ourselves to understand that it's not by having only a, a Parisian view on the issue of poverty that we will get anywhere. We need to look around the world, co-construct that. Then we look at the digital transformation of higher education, at the different innovations that are possible in teaching and learning. The many says, in order to best grab and seize the opportunities that are on offer today, also thanks to this digitalization that we did not even dare touch on in the past. So we have to get rid of that what not, does not work, but also really look at what does work. What do we keep? How do we enhance it for the the best of, uh, of everyone. And they're in the digital space, always make sure that it is not one part of the world driven and driving uh, the, the knowledge um, system, but that it comes from everywhere. So that we, again, have this co-creation and, um, and, and opportunity to work together. Then we will have uh, others uh, that we, we create together. We will have um, and the presentation of the IAU at 70 uh, book with uh, more than, than 80 uh, people who have contributed beautiful texts on past, present and future. We will have the presentation and launch of a, of a similar book, uh, Higher Education's Response to the Pandemic, Building a More Sustainable and Democratic Future, that is published uh, by um, uh, the Council of Europe. Um, and so we will look at those dimensions as well, but uh, with contributions from all around the world again. And so that's how we move into the future. Some milestones for the IAU. 
the World Conference Education for Sustainable Development to take place in Berlin in May. And the second milestone will be October with the World Higher Education Conference 2021. All of these debates will help fuel um, a better uh, common vision of higher education for the future. So it's a pity we're not together. Otherwise, I would have said we need to continue. We take a nice glass of wine, <laughs> why not, or anything else together, or a juice or a coffee, or we sit with a nice cup of tea. Yes, water it is for now. <laughs> but we would have the opportunity to discuss more. I think this is only the beginning of longer conversations. So thank you for your wonderful contributions. And, um, and uh, you see how passionate it makes me because I think we have here the pipit, as we say in French, those that you have on the wall, like Kisha be behind you, those, those little pieces of gold to co-construct a better higher education for a better future together. So thank you so much and sorry for having been a bit long. <laughs> Also from my part, thank you very, very also much for all your fantastic very, contributions. Very and all also Michael Hosher, he's awesome, he's Michael definitely Hosher. there. And uh, it's been a great, great joy. And, uh, and uh, Lakeisha Ransom, Peter Basson, Michael Hosher, and thank you very much Michael Michael Hosher, also for very much emphatically also driving the message. Driving your message. Thank you very much for this. Thank you very much for this.